Aloha and welcome. Welcome to Global Connections. I'm your host, Carlos Juarez, and it's great to welcome you here. We've got a special show today where we're going to be exploring uh, the topic of dysfunctional democracy, American style. And what do we mean by that? Well, the U.S. political system, of course, it's uh, been in our news quite a bit lately with the recent elections. Uh, it's still ongoing. But more particularly, we're going to get some insights from uh, two guests that I have joining me today. Uh, they're young leaders who come to us from Mexico, and actually that's where I'm joining you as well. Uh, here on Global Connections, we bring uh, informed perspective, insights from all over the world. And so joining me today, I'm, I'm delighted to welcome two uh, college students who are in Mexico. Uh, one of them first, Larissa Rosales, and and the other is Mireya Rosado. And so let me turn to both of you and first welcome you. I'm very happy that you can join us here on Global Connections. Uh, and I wanna briefly ask if each of you can just introduce yourselves, tell us your name, where you're from in Mexico and what is it you're studying there? So Larissa, please uh, welcome to Global Connections. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. It's an honor to be here with you. And yes, my name is Larissa Rosales. I am an undergraduate student. I study international relations here in Puebla at the Universidad de las Americas Puebla. Excellent, thank you. And Mireya, please, welcome to the show as well. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for, for the invitation also. I'm also very honored to be here. Um, I, I also study international relations in the Univers Universidad de las Americas Puebla, but I am from Merida, Yucatan. Excellent. So. Oh. Well, fantastic. So basically two young leaders who, um, you know, you are both students of international relations, a, a social science that looks at understanding different aspects of the world of, you know, even important relations that Mexico has with its neighbor to the north of uh, the United States. But of course, like all of the world and like all of the country in the US, we've been observing these recent weeks, the, the culmination of the presidential election, well, the bigger election, let's say. Uh, and it's called a lot of attention to the political system. It's in crisis, uh, you know, how is it functioning? But especially for many observers, it, it, it just looks chaotic. And so maybe before we look into the inner details, I wanted to ask you if you can offer some initial reflections uh, on what what this recent presidential election was like for you as a as an international uh, you know college student uh, what did it seem like what did you take away what did you find interesting or confusing about it so we can start with the idea perhaps larissa what are some first thoughts on just the, uh, what we just finished watching in the us yes of course well for me it was really interesting to see that uh, what we conceive as the best democracy in the world does have problems in the most basic aspect of a democracy, that it's an election, right? And so we have so many takeaways about all this debate of if the popular vote is or not in the constitution, which is not. And so like all this debate about what would happen if, if, if Trump won, if Trump didn't won, like would the states acknowledge all the electoral uh, points to the popular vote or will they decide on their own like what would happen next and also it was really interesting to see uh, how a president for the first time was not conceding and up today like even though he has already allowed certain processes of the um, uh, to give power to biden like they are already taking place he hasn't conceded yet like in like as it should have been and so it is interesting to see that what happens here in Mexico that we have a, a history of electoral fraud that of course that it's not a reality in, in the United States, but something that happens here and it happens in some other democracies that are not uh, as as good as that of the United States, it's, it's interesting to know that it happens in the United States as well. Yeah, and you touch on several things there. Of course, first of all, we want to make clear, and, and I think you touched on this briefly, the U.S., at least in the modern recent past, does not have a history of massive electoral fraud. It just has not been. And even this election now, we're seeing now that the outcome is, is making clear that most of these states are confirming, you know, a pretty clean election. Uh, that is what I'm getting at here is the president, as you said, continues to deny, uh, you know, the outcome and, and allege without a lot of evidence all these claims. Well, eventually that'll putter out, but maybe more to the point, you touched on the idea of good democracies, and I thought that was a curious way of putting it, because certainly the U.S. has long been a model of a democratic system, one of the longest continually existing. It's been a, a system that many parts of the world have looked at as, as, you know, here's how it works. Now, having said that, obviously the U.S. has some shortcomings, some uh, in dip, dip, challenges here and there. Uh, we'll try to talk to some of those. When we talk about a dysfunctional democracy, what do we mean? But first, Mireya, let me just ask you, maybe give us some initial impressions. Uh, we just saw this recent election. What were some of your takeaways? What did you be? 
Go ahead. So, uh, like like Larissa said, um, uh, so this election and also the past election has thought of a lot uh, all around the world about how the system, the the political system of the United States work. I, I think that most people around the world don't know what a complicated political system and, and more specifically uh, electoral system does the United States have. And it was very funny to notice that, especially in these elections, everybody was like, um, like trying to find out, trying to understand how the, the, the electoral system of the United States work. And maybe even I, 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 I might um, say that maybe even some people in the United States are starting to question how the how this system works mm -hmm. since the past election, because it's like it's, it's, it has not been a lot of times uh, since uh, a president has won. Uh, well, last time the president won without the popular vote. And this mm -hmm. time there was a fear that the president could win without also the popular vote. So there have been uh, a lot of questioning about this electoral system, and it has been like seen nowadays. And this was something that is not only inside the United States, but also has been all around the world. In another class, we were discussing that uh, maybe we should all uh, be able to vote in the election of the, of the United States, like because we, we find it very interesting, and we are constantly informing more, more than ever in this election. Yes, and it's an interesting, you, you mentioned that. I mean, the United States, of course, is such an important power uh, as a global power, uh, you know, the largest economy that has a tremendous impact. But, uh, you know, you say that rather somewhat as a joke, you know, that maybe, you know, you should be able to vote. And indeed, uh, the fact is, uh, the choices and the policies that the U.S. has directly affect Mexico, whether it's trade or migration, et cetera. Back to your first thought, though, is that obviously the world, not just the world, but even the United States is looking every four years when we have the U.S. elections. Many people are surprised to learn that it is an indirect election of the president. It's been that way always. But normally when you vote, you assume you just count the ballots and the one with the most wins. Well, as we are seeing here, it, it plays out in a very different way. Uh, but let me turn us to shift a little bit and talk about um, this idea of a dysfunctional democracy. And, you know, both of you actually as students of mine in, in a class, uh, we've recently been looking at some, um, uh, some different uh, arguments that are out there. And one, uh, a book has recently been published by a, a distinguished Mexican um, scholar, a, a former foreign minister, Jorge Castañeda. And he has an interesting book that is called America Through Foreign Eyes, where he kind of looks at the image of the US from abroad. But of course, he sees it as well as somebody who has long been uh, living and connected to the US, a uh, professor at New York University, but a former foreign minister. And in this book, he describes a little bit this idea of uh, the US political system as being dysfunctional. And I wonder if maybe picking up on that, maybe uh, we can what are some of the key points that he touches on and, 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 and how can we reflect on it? And perhaps starting with you, Larissa, I think the idea uh, that we've explored talking before was how the system in the US has been around so long, but in fact, it was created in a different time, a different era, a different society. And here we are today, 2020, uh, the US is still the same system, but it's a different place, right? So I wonder if you can, building on that, uh, maybe talk a little bit about this idea of the dysfunctional nature of the American political system. Um, yes, of course. Uh, well, one of the points that is touched in this book about the idea of a dysfunctional democracy in the United States refers to that that you just said, that at the beginning, uh, more, more than 150 years ago, the electoral system, like to, to put it as an example, was designed, in fact, to exclude people. Uh, because it was designed to exclude slaves, to exclude uh, women, etc., and just to focus on an homogeneous society that was um, uh, white men, right? Like and men, white men, and and rich men, like in a socialist status, like a high social status. Mm -hmm. And so right now, that the um, United States has a like demographics are changing. It ex keeps excluding that new people. Of course, that white people are still the majority. But there are other important minorities like Hispanic people, like women, like black people, et cetera. And they are being excluded right now but as, by a system that was created for an homogeneous uh, society. And so in that sense, the political system and the people who are in power are trying to keep that system homogeneous by uh, techniques like gerrymandering and by uh, making it more difficult for certain people to vote 
like to make the procedure more complex, et cetera, in order to keep the balance in a system that it was not made to include a diversity and a plurality of people. Yeah, no, it's a very fair point. And, and I mean, in a nutshell, it's that the system was set up at a different time, maybe with a different society and reality. Uh, and, and, and yet over time, the country has changed. And here we have today this complex, large, multiracial, multi-ethnic. Remarkably, on the one hand, the system has continued. And, and I think there's something to be said about that. It's very resilient. It has, it has not changed. And yet, maybe it's not delivering in the same way that it was intended. Uh, you, you mentioned a few different things like the, the concept of gerrymandering, a very political process where you know those in power decide how the districts are going to be decided and, and that has you know direct implications for who gets elected um, the other is the idea of voter suppression that's a very hot topic these days and it was there from the beginning in the sense that the founders of the U.S. political system they did not envision a direct democracy where everybody would vote everybody would have equal rights and you know as you mentioned it's basically you know the dominant elite they were largely whites and they had to be property owners. And so they were, you know, a small privileged elite. Um, so nevertheless, the system has evolved. And here we are today, lots of challenges, different pressures, different groups, uh, uh, and and maybe many who feel that the system is not working for them. Uh, maybe, uh, Mireya, if I can ask you uh, any thoughts on, on, again, this idea the, of either the nature of American society or how the system has not evolved, or is it in crisis now? What, what do you think, Mireya? Okay, so I think that many of the things that are uh, mentioned on that book are very interesting and make us like reflect on other like more deep subjects, such as I was thinking about the term of institutions. So uh, we have always seen the United States as a very institutionalized political system. So that is something that we as uh, Latin Americans admire very much. And it's something that is, well, yeah, it's, it's, very, it's, it's a very good uh, thing about the political system of the United States, that resilience that you mentioned, because, well, that has provided a certain stability for like 150 years, a, a lot of time, and it has worked very well. But the thing is that uh, times change and the priorities change. Also, like the concept of democracy has also changed. So the United States was a very functional democracy when it started to be a democracy. So that the, that system was planned to be to work for that to to make sure that that kind of democracy that was considered at that time the kind of democracy that uh, that provided that the people who should have the right to vote were educated, had, had money, had uh, like opportunities. Uh, and well, in some of the groups that I would say that are not, uh, are not um, right now, they are not minorities, but I like to call, I, I heard like this, this uh, concept and I like to call them that way, like minoritized groups because they are no longer a minority. So uh, those people were not, uh, were, were, could not like vote or, or could not uh, express themselves right in that kind of democracy at that time. But now they they can and they should. And the system that is like very resilient and that's a good thing is being like an obstacle for them. Oh, fascinating. No, a very good way to put it. And I think you touch on the idea that this concept of democracy, it's, democracy, obviously it has evolved and changed. And today we expect and demand different rights than even what our grandparents might have done. And certainly uh, what the founding fathers. Now, real quick, a uh, point of clarification. I think you made a reference to 150 years. It's actually been 240 years. So uh, from the you know 1780s, late 1700s. Um, so it is a system that has been remarkable and not changing, but often it can be criticized as, that same reality is it hasn't become modern. Uh, it hasn't adapted to, if you look at other political systems of modern democracies, let's say the examples of J Germany and Japan, they have very modern constitutions that guarantee you know, lots of detailed rights. And actually even the Mexican constitution, I will tell you is a lot more detailed in terms of what it says. Now, how much it can be implemented or, or, or carried out is another question, but by contrast, the American constitution, the US constitution, is somewhat limited and, 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 and instead it, it gets interpreted continually. Uh, let me turn to shift to another thing because one of the challenges of the American political system, especially when you look at it from the outside is 
the power of this two-party system, the two political parties. So in the end, if you want to run for office, if you want to choose a president, you have two options. And most of the world, we often see differences. Yes, there are many places that have a cluster of, you know, a right of center and a left of center. But I wonder from your perspective, uh, and maybe turning to you, Larissa, uh, what do you see in the two-party system? Is it healthy? Is it is it stable? Or is it maybe part of the problem that makes it dysfunctional? Uh, and, and maybe, again, from your understanding of political party systems in other countries, or just how you see it compared to what you know? Uh, yeah, well, I think that, um, again, the, important, the, the most important part of that democracy is pluralism. And from my point of view, I don't know how plural is uh, a political and an electoral system with just two parties, right? Like, can you really uh, cover all the interests of the people in just two parties? And actually, two parties that for many people are seem uh, like really um, uh, alike from each other. Like, of course, that right now we're seeing a broader polarization, right? Like one uh, going more to left, the other one going more to the, to the right. But at the end, uh, we can see it with, uh, with Biden, like he was elected as a candidate because he's more in the middle. So we're not really uh, seeing like a contrast of interest, like really um, different from each other. So I don't know, like for me, uh, plural, plural, pluralism is not reflected there. Mm -hmm. And in a sense also like when there are several parties that doesn't that doesn't mean that it is a functional democracy either for example yeah. here in mexico we have a lot of parties and uh not because we have more parties it it means that more um interests are are portrayed there and also like ones that they come to power to to power most of them do not really change things like they stay just in the same line and they do not um yeah, they do not respect what they promise. So like, it, it is not necessarily more a functional when there are more parties. Yeah, and it's interesting because uh, you mentioned the political party system and it is true that, especially when you look at it from the outside, they're actually very similar. They're very sort of centrist parties somewhat. Obviously there are differences, but this is something that's hard many for many Americans to appreciate. And the reality is that in a lot of other political systems, you often have more parties and those parties often represent more narrow interests maybe it's a green party or it's a you know a far right party or whatever it might be multiple parties allow you to have more narrow focus when you have these two catch-all parties it's hard for them to be that obviously they try to and perhaps arguably the democrat party tends to be more of an umbrella party that tries to bring everybody in the problem there is that they can't be something for everybody so they have a challenge the republican party increasingly is more and more narrow perhaps uh, uh, not as broad, but uh, there you have it. Uh, let me continue and maybe uh, talking a little bit more about this system because the American political system, of course, it's been established and been in place so long. Uh, and yet that seems to be how the founders establish it to, to make it enduring. I mean, I don't know if they imagined it was gonna be 200 plus years, but maybe the point I'm asking here is that obviously that system is also very hard to change. And so you have a trade-off. Uh, on the one hand, it's stable. It's been around a long time. But on the other hand, it's difficult to change. And if you can't change, then you run into some problems. So I wonder, Mireya, just, I mean, what are some of the difficulties or challenges of a system that is on one hand stable, but maybe difficult to change? Uh, or more generally, I mean, I don't know, just some continued observations on uh, how you see the, the American political system. Okay, uh, so like like we were talking about at the beginning, uh, like the uh, talking about the concept of, of institutions that uh, like actually the, the this chapter that we read uh, made me reflect a lot about the concept of institutions and how the American political system is actually an institution and something that uh, a very important characteristic about institutions is that they are resilient and that they are uh, traditionally that they are um stable and they that they don't change a lot so that makes it like pol the american politics pretty stable but uh they also should be and i think that this is a, a concept or a characteristic that has become more used useful um like late lately 
that they should be also adaptable because circumstances change a lot. And we have, cha uh, we have seen that the United States is changing a lot. And even uh, the political parties, we were I, I wanted to make also a comment about the political parties. I think that, well, traditionally, uh, to have two political parties also makes the United States maybe more stable or even like we can, we could see it like that. Like, that. like Larissa said, here in Mexico, we have a multi-party system, and does that does not make exactly our system like very stable? So we continually associate like having a lot of uh, representation or a lot of parties or different voices with not a lot of stability. So personally, I at the beginning I saw like a bi-party system, a two-party system. Uh, as a stable system, but continually with the current conditions, I now see that it's not very, it's not, it's, it's not very beneficial. It actually enforces polarization. And now we are used to talk about the Republicans or the Democrats as if they were like only two kinds of Americans, but actually there are a lot of people inside both parties who have different views. So I think that the two party system does not help with that. And yeah. Yeah, that's a, a, a dilemma between the the stability and the adaptability to the current situation. No, no, very well put. And indeed, it, it, that's the trade-off because yes, it is a stability that helps endure and, and shows the importance of this institutionalization. And indeed, something we don't always understand or appreciate is that why do we have only two parties in the US? It's not like it's a fixed reason. The Constitution says nothing at all about, about political parties. They emerge organically on their own. But in the end, it is the rules and it is the electoral system in the US that makes it very difficult for smaller parties. Uh, and uh, you know, I can't uh, elaborate too much more detail, but basically the single member districts that exist where you have to get a majority in all of those makes it hard for a smaller party. Uh, and let's just leave it at that for now. At the end of the day, we have two political parties. And yes, they are increasingly polarized and today more than ever. And actually, uh, uh, I shared this with you in different times, but something about the US political system for many, many years, it was characterized as bipartisan. There was a lot more cooperation that occurred. This has been eroding now in the last 10, 20 years, especially probably began in the 90s with a, you know, a growing movement uh, initially, uh, what would he call them? The well, the, it was the contract with America with Newt Gingrich in the 1990s, and they began to push a very polarized view. Then we have the advent, as we know now, with social media that helps to further push a lot of that. And so we have a polarization. It's not unique to the US, of course, many places see it overall. Uh, but coming back now, and maybe as we continue and finish some thoughts on the US political system, um, you know, it is a paradox because it continues to be a country that is, well, I shouldn't say continues because right now it's in a difficult situation, right? Given what's been playing out and given the election of Donald Trump, it has eroded a lot of the image of the US abroad. And maybe I would turn on that. Um, you have all seen now, uh, in, in you know, in these recent years, the the presidency of Donald Trump. It's been a very uh, maybe more antagonistic, more assertive foreign policy, including with Mexico. Very you know, very difficult relations. Uh, eventually, they found a, an accommodation, but of course, not after uh, Donald Trump made some very strong changes to U.S. policy and immigration and forcing Mexico to control the southern border, et cetera, et cetera. But let me get at this. Um, when you look at the American political system, are you able to see the system as something that is separate and enduring versus the individual Donald Trump, who is the leader today of the country and indeed the leader of the Republican Party? We still don't know the outcome. Uh, no, let me rephrase that. We know the outcome. What I what I want to say is we don't know what's going to happen with Trump. Is he going to continue with the political ambition? Is he going to try to run for office in four years? We don't know. But um, I guess I go back to this are you able to separate that individual and what he represents from the system and the society that it's a part of, but also separate? So more generally, where does Donald Trump fit into this? Uh, he will be leaving office probably on January 20th. That's what we all expect. Uh, but his legacy will still be there, right? And, and whatever he's done, or maybe the things that he represents. So maybe just some final thoughts on this. I mean, where do we see the US going forward in the future now that we have a, a transition in the works? Uh, perhaps Larissa, starting with you. Yes, thank you. Well, yeah, as you said, I think that even, well, Trump is going to leave office, like eventually, like uh, rather if he wants or not, it is going to happen. But yeah, it's true that 
the people who voted for them, uh, for him, sorry, that was actually uh, millions of people to a wall of America. 70 million, 70 million yeah. plus, yes. Yeah, exactly. So like uh, that people are going to uh, remain there and their interests are very likely to be the same for at least another uh, 10 <clears throat> years or so until their problems are solved. So yeah, of course that Trumpism or the idea that he represents like uh, giving priority to the economy, like rejecting global warming and all these, like it is going to uh, still be there. But the other part that uh, Trump represents, like uh, not caring about institutions, not caring about foreign affairs, like just treating everything that he wants and, and without thinking about the, the consequences, I think that is not going to happen anymore. Because as Mireya was saying, uh, the USA has really strong institutions. And as every democracy, there can be uh, a, a person who arrives to power, but uh, just like a momentary thing. That doesn't mean that he's going to change everything. Like mm -hmm. the system hasn't changed as we were saying for 200 years. So I don't think that a single person is going to be able to change it. Yes, mm -hmm. certain interests are going to remain, to remain there. And so uh, the Biden, um, when he enters to power, he is going to have to, to think how is he going to include all these people. And in later elections, like new candidates are going to have to think about this as well. But no, I don't think that, that Trump is the only, like it's going to be the, the thing that is going to erode the, the political system. No, I, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Oh, very well said. Well, listen, uh, in the last uh, moment we have here, another minute or two, uh, Mireya, perhaps a, a similar concluding, concluding thoughts. Where do you see, I guess, either this phenomenon of Trump or Trumpism or what he represents, because yes, he will leave office, but he will still be around. We don't know if he's gonna become a media giant or if he'll go hiding or what, but more than that, the ideas, the issues that he represents, the 70 plus million who voted for him clearly um, and the polarized nature of the country. Will it survive? We've talked about a dysfunctional democracy. It is chaotic, but is this just the reality we have to accept? Or how do you see things as we move forward maybe in, in the coming years, Mireya? Okay, uh, thank you. So I agree with Larissa. I think that the the strong institutions of the United States will uh, will survive Trump. So uh, and also I want to make this remark, which I uh, a lot make it a lot of I make it a lot of times, but that yes, there are seventy plus million people who voted for for Trump, but th that does not mean that those people are uh, are a big fans of. Donald Trump. Maybe they they agree with some things uh, with him or the party, or they agree more with him than with Biden. So because like that a lot of people voted from, for Trump, that does not really mean that there are a lot of people that are influenced by Trump. So I tend to be a, a more positive about this. I think that even the 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 defeat of Donald Trump could ha could bring very good things to the Republican Party because I think that the presence of Donald Trump really uh, uh, was was an obstacle to many of the actual uh, like very partisanship that yes that has been eroding but that eroding even more it, that eroded even more with Donald Trump and that we might uh, get back to some of it especially because Joe Biden is seen as as a as a as a person of dialogue that promotes like this maybe like uh, cooperation between both parties because he's a more traditional uh, politician, so he's used to the, this bipartisanship and he might, uh, I hope he will uh, bring that again. And but well, another a, a thing that is not that positive about about Joe Biden is that he's like very traditional, so he will be. Uh, he will bring that tradition back and that institutionalism, but also we don't know how adaptable that that will be. Exactly. No, very well said. And I think uh, we'll finish on that note because it summarizes the same as the U.S. system. It's been around a long time, but is it sufficient to adapt? Well, probably we'll see. Uh, Joe Biden has a lot of experience, but is he in a position now to adapt to these changes? We'll have to see. Uh, but in the end, I think you've, you've uh, offered us some valuable insights. I want to thank both of you for joining me today on Global Connections. Uh, 
dialogue about this dysfunctional democracy uh, in the U.S. It's a curious system, and we're watching it unfold. Uh, we'll obviously come back for more on this dialogue, but thank you again, Mireya and Larissa, for joining me on Global Connections today. And for you, our listeners, a chance to dialogue about these issues and Thank you again. Uh, join us for the next Global Connections here. I'm your host, Carlos Juarez. Aloha.